Hi. In this talk I am going to show you how to use open source debug tooling, render doc in particular, to find the origin of non-trivial issues in the real world games and applications. It is something that all of us have to do, but the methods aren't well documented and everyone has some tricks up in their sleeve. So I think this talk would be especially useful for someone who is starting to debug various games. But I like to think that even seasoned veterans would find a couple of useful tricks. But before, briefly about me. I started on the other side of the barricades. I've been a game developer and witnessed the horrors of the mobile drivers, when they were in a much worse shape than now. Afterwards, I accidentally was offered to work on Mesa and debugged all kinds of issues in various games and applications since then. Since late 2020, I am at Egalia, now working on open source Vulkan driver for Adreno GPUs, called Turnip. As a graphics driver developer, one faces many different bugs. A lot of debugging is making educated guesses, however there are always generic things to try first. Here you could see a few examples of the issues I investigated in the past. The bottom one is a flickering of geometry in The Witcher 3 on Intel's GPU, which was the most insidious issue I debugged. It was random, it was impossible to inspect up close, hard to narrow down, and at the end it required a workaround which worked for unknown reason. Fortunately, a lot of issues are much simpler than that, and mostly have a generic flow for investigation. Up to a certain point, of course. For the purpose of choosing how to debug the issue, I categorize them by two distinct characteristics. The biggest concern for us is temporal stability of the issue. The issue which happens across several frames and in the fixed place is easy to capture and relatively easy to debug. On the other hand, if the issue happens randomly, and what's worse in a single frame, it could be impossible to capture and much harder to debug. Orthogonal to stability is how the issue manifests. If colors are incorrect, the first thing you would look at are textures and fragment shaders. If it is geometry that is wrong, one would look at vertex shader and incoming vertices. For hangs, you would look everywhere, unless you got some useful information from the kernel. The cause for the issues could also be categorized. Undefined behavior of an application is usually found with validation layers, or by inspecting a single frame, or calls across several frames. Shader miscompilation is also likely to be found by inspecting the frame. On the other hand, missed or wrong updates of the GPU state could be harder to find, and hardware bugs are all over the place. Later I'll talk about different tips to how to debug different issues. But now, let's take a look at the real-world issue I fixed in Turnip earlier this year. It happened in a droid game called Genshin Impact. The game had a major misrendering in the main menu, which you could see in this slide. The game shouldn't be that blue. The steps I'll take are easily generalizable to a big chunk of issues. I followed them myself more times than I could remember. This issue was stable across frames, was not a regression, and seemed to be some kind of a shader issue. So the easiest way was to analyze the frame. For this, our only open source option is RenderDoc. I left aside the troubles of capturing this frame. So here, it is already opened in RenderDoc. The first thing we should check is whether the misrendering is captured by RenderDoc. Sometimes, especially when an issue is caused by the lack of synchronization, we will see perfectly correct result in the capture. It could be a good clue. In our case, yes, the misrendering is present in the final image, and it looks the same as in the game. Now we will try to find a draw call which caused the misrendering. RenderDoc could show which call or call range changed the resource. In our case we are likely interested only in FBO writes. So we should follow them. Alternatively, you could uh, do some kind of bisection by selecting calls in the event browser you could see on the left. So let's follow the FBO writes. When you try to find the first incorrect call, keep in mind that the issue may happen in a range of calls instead of some specific one. So if there is even a slightest doubt, double and triple check your findings. Otherwise a lot of time could be wasted in the steps which would follow.
We seem to found a render pass with the issue. Now we should find the draw call. And double check that is the right one. Here is our call. It looks like some kind of a post-process effect. Now that we have the call, let's check that the issue is not in the shader inputs. There are three ways to do it. Eyeball the inputs. Compare the inputs to a driver where the frame is known to be correct. Or run the shader with the same inputs on a different hardware. The last method is easy with RenderDoc. It has a software SPV and the XBC shader interpreter we can use. However, keep in mind that it does not handle everything and may refuse to work. In example last time, it didn't work with float controls extension. To debug fragment shader, I am selecting a pixel and pressing debug. This would bring us to the shader debugger. Since we are interested in the color, we should note the output variable for the color. Then skip to the end of the shader and compare resulting value with the one from GPU. They are different. But wait a minute, here we see the color that shader produced. But the color in our FBO is blended. So we are comparing apples to oranges. Fortunately, we could just clear the FBO to a white color just before the draw happens. That's better. Correcting for the blend, the values are still different. So most likely it's a shader miscompilation. But for completeness sake, let's say both the inputs. The only texture is a depth buffer. It's hard to see anything, but there is a button to narrow down the color range in such cases. The buffers seem fine. The spot where you check the inputs and say it is fine is based mostly on experience and intuition. But if there are doubts, it's better to capture and inspect a similar frame on other GPU, where it is rendered correctly. This takes time and not always possible so it's faster to use intuition until you hit a dead end. Next ones are UBOS and SSBOS. Usually it is hard to tell if they are fine. I mostly assume that they are, unless I see nuns or other strange values. Then there is mesh and variance. If we had troubles with geometry, this would be the first place we should have checked. Since geometry doesn't trouble us, the only thing to check are the variants. Again, without a direct comparison, it is hard to tell whether they are fine. Sometimes they are just obviously wrong. We reviewed the inputs, and we are back to the fragment shader. Firstly, we should check near and GPU assemblies, which could be done with the help of VK pipeline executable properties extension. Unless you have near or assembly interpreter in the head, and I think some of you may have one, you could just look for weird constructions, some rare or unexpected instructions, or possible warnings. Here we have near translated from SPIRV, near after all optimizations, and native GPU assembly after all optimizations. I see nothing fancy here, which leaves us with bisection of the shader. RenderDoc helpfully allows us to decompile the shader into GLSL and edit it. In most cases the compiled shader compiles back without any trouble, but sometimes it requires minor changes to function names. Firstly, it is good to check if compiling the decompiled shader back changes anything. It could happen, and would indicate that we likely aren't handling some SPIRV construction, which just goes away after a compilation. As you could see, nothing changed. Then we should proceed with shader by section as promised. The idea is simple. We go into the middle of the shader and output some variable which took many previous instructions to calculate. Compile the shader and compare the output with RenderDocs interpreter. Now repeat until we find the issue. 
since we are selecting a variable based on intuition, we may miss the interesting one. In such case, we would just backtrack and be a bit more careful. Usually, I dump variable near the flow control, write to external memory, or rarely used function. I wrote the first chosen variable, and its values seem to be 1, given the blending. Now, let's see which value RenderDoc will compute. For this variable, the values are the same. Let's pick another one further down the shader. Let's see what we have in this one. I already see some strange values. They shouldn't be that big. Will RenderDog give the same values? No, they are completely different. Then we should check the values assigned to this variable. This one has a small value. And this one too. But after assignment, uh, in the if statement, we see a completely different value. We should recheck it to be sure. Yes, they are completely different. Then likely this is if statement, which is causes miscompilation. We should look into result in assembly. We are left with roughly this snippet from the shader, which is incorrectly compiled. Since it is an if statement which causes the issue, we will have to pay special attention to the corresponding instructions in the GPU assembly. I obtained the assembly with pipeline executable properties extension. This is a bad assembly from the code with the if statement. This is a good assembly where we removed the if statement. What could we do with them? Going line by line, both assemblies should produce expected for them results. The only suspicious instruction is cell. Selection instruction, which corresponds to the if condition in the original code. We were getting unclaimed values. They were above 1. It is not something that could be produced by saturation, which clamps the value between 0 and 1. So maybe saturation modifier doesn't work. The easiest way would be to directly edit the shader's assembly. Unfortunately, we cannot edit the assembly through RenderDoc. There is no Vulkan extension for this. Maybe we could make one? There were many times I could have used it. What else could we do? Some drivers, including Turnip, have the ability to replace a shader assembly given the shader hash, which we could use to test our theory. After editing the assembly, I concluded that removal of the saturation modifier doesn't change anything. However, if I move the saturation modifier from the selection instruction, to the instructions which produce its sources. The issue disappeared. Together, this means the saturation modifier doesn't work on a selection instruction. I double-checked it in a standalone reproducer, 
and search the assembly from the proprietary driver to see whether it ever emits such construction. It did not. After confirming it, it was trivially fixed by preventing saturation modifier from being applied to this instruction. This concludes my example, and as I said, the steps I followed are applicable to many issues you may face. What are the other useful RenderDoc capabilities? The most useful for us are, firstly, being able to view and export any input to the pipeline, vertices, UBOs, SSBOs, textures, everything you may want. Possibility to inspect the state of any shader stage, to inspect variance between each shader stage. This variance inspection is possible thanks to the most cursed Vulkan extension, VKX Transform Feedback. Next one, Software Debugger for SpearV, is a relatively recent addition, and as we have seen, it is very effective, allowing to find the issue without resorting to making and opening the capture on another GPU. However, there are possible improvements to be made for our use case. In example, evaluate all fragments and show the difference with GPU result. Or being able to immediately view the result after shader edit, without closing the tab, pressing the bug, going to the end of the shader, and so on. Another one is even more recent addition is the support for printfs in the shader. In fragment shader it is easy to just output the value to the FBO, bearing the blending of course. However, for other stages, printf is truly welcomed. I also want to highlight the Python API. With it you could add new UI widgets or automate tasks. Maybe we could make some plugins to ease the debugging. The only task I actually automated in the past was the searching for the first call which produces different outputs, giving the same inputs between several runs. Sometimes you find that misrendering is caused by the wrong inputs to a shader, and these inputs are always different between runs. This could be hard to narrow down, especially when a game uses a lot of compute shaders juggling many intermediary buffers. I automated it, which helped me a couple of times. Another useful feature is the pixel history. It allows to quickly find which recall writes the fragment to the FBO. Uh, when there are hundreds or thousands of draw calls, it could be rather useful. And the final one are draw call overlays. Highlighting draw call and making a mesh wireframe makes easy to identify what exactly current draw call has drawn. The stencil test visualizes which fragment passed the test or was rejected. Displaying infinities and not the numbers could show us potential issues in a shader. The usefulness of clearing before the draw I already demonstrated. As mentioned previously, there are also certain limitations. Synchronization issues tend to go away in the capture. However, not every issue that is not reproduced in, a, in the capture is a synchronization issue, and vice versa. It is impossible to inspect interframe issues, which is a big limitation, and there is no other open source tool to fill the gap since GFX Reconstruct doesn't have the ability to inspect anything. Capturing a hand could be tricky or plainly impossible. Sometimes hand completely hangs a device, or even if not, it may destabilize application enough for RenderDoc to fail. You cannot edit shader inputs or any Vulkan call parameters. This is another big limitation. The ability to edit parameters was quite helpful in Apitrace when I debugged issues with OpenGL. RenderDoc requires a lot of RAM for capture, which may not be there for on ARM devices. The last one haunts Turnip at the moment. I could replace the trace of a game, but couldn't make a capture to investigate the misrendering. Which brings us to the issue that captures are not compatible between different GPU vendors, sometimes between GPU generations, and even driver versions. It poses an issue in the cases where we cannot make a capture on the target device due to a hang or because application doesn't run on the device, or target device doesn't have enough of memory. It could probably be solved by memory remapping like it was done in GFX Reconstruct in conjecture with device simulation Vulkan layers. Sometimes you cannot make a right capture because the issue appears only for a few frames, or there is a hand causing capture failure. First one could be worked around by making a trace with GFX Reconstruct, 
replaying it frame by frame to find the one you want and telling RenderDoc which frame to capture from GFX Reconstruct Trace. Helped me a lot in the past. If there is a hand causing failure of a capture, you could try to make the hand go away by any means, like preventing specific draw or dispatch to actually happen. Then making a capture and checking that it hangs without the previous changes. In the past that helped me to debug hangs which completely hanged the system, without any recovery. Uh, by making a trace and keeping the call from being executed, I was able to inspect the shader and its inputs to make a standalone reproducer. That's all about RenderDoc. What else could we do besides inspecting the frame? Before even inspecting the frame, it is a good idea to use Vulkan validation layers to find whether the application violates the spec and there is no point in investigating further. Validation layers are the easiest way to find Vulkan misuse and should be the first thing you would try. However, not every error or warning corresponds to a real issue, and it may be hard to distinguish them. Though they could tell which places to check first with RenderDoc. Some useful validations are in the warning category, which isn't enabled by default. Make sure to enable it. The last option is to enable GPU-assisted validation to catch out-of-bounds issues in the shaders, if there are any. The driver itself could have a ways to debug an issue. There are several debug options which are great to have in the driver. Option to synchronize every call helps detecting synchronization issues, saving a lot of time. Forcing the re-emission of state for every draw call helps catching the issues with updates of the state. After that you could bisect the state to find which one exactly causes the trouble. Forcing the spilling for shader registers may be a crude way to check if issue is related to shader miscompilation or spilling itself. Substitution of shader assembly I mentioned before. Depending on the driver, there could be many more useful toggles. Now, what to do if we are unable to find the cause by inspecting the frame? But the capture at least reproduces the issue. If we are able to find the problematic draw call, we could attempt to make a standalone reproducer. Unfortunately, RenderDoc doesn't have a magic button to export a draw call to C code or something like that. Though GFX Reconstruct is planning to support exporting a trace as a compilable code. For now, the only uh, thing that left is to manually create either a number test or a standalone reproducer to mimic the call. RenderDoc allows to export buffers and textures in a binary format, so it's not that hard to do, but may take too much time and may lead nowhere. Without a way for an easy export, I think it's better to do this only as a last resort. Recently I had to do this for an issue with tessellation shader in Grand Theft Auto V on Turnip. It was impossible even to make RenderDoc capture to inspect the draw call due to the lack of RAM. So the only way to find out what's wrong was to write a reproducer. Here is the draw call extracted as a number test. It was much easier to work and experiment with. It also allowed me to run it on the proprietary driver and compare the results with Turnip, which quickly yielded the solution. To create a number test, I saved every buffer the draw call used and bound them with slots, offsets and ranges I saw in the render doc. It is a bit tedious, but easy to do. Aside from good old intuition, there are many more things to try. For hangs, you could inspect the GPU state which is dumped on the hang. Its usefulness varies between report and GPU vendor, but you could try. For shader yielding an unexpected result, it could be possible to instrument it and see what is really happening on GPU. That's not something that's available on open source drivers, though I recently made a prototype for Turnip, which I successfully used a couple of times. Another method to try is to compare the states emitted between your driver and the proprietary one, if there is any, and it does the work correctly. That is all. Thank you for listening. If I didn't elaborate anything, forgot to mention something useful, or you have any question about debugging, ask them. Okay, thank you very much for your talk, Danilo. And uh, now we have time for some questions. So, Baldur Colson asks, have you tried editing captures for anything, exporting from to XML or zip? It's slow, but I've used it for debugging render doc issues, which can be investigated in other ways. 
uh, I didn't know about uh, this functionality. I knew that you could export to XML, uh, but I never tried to edit and open it back. Yes, it sounds a bit tedious, but uh, it could have saved me some time in some issues I had in the past. But yes, it sounds slow. Okay. Okay. Uh, looks like there are no more questions for now. So thank you very much for the great talk, Daniel, and have a great yes. rest of the conference. Thanks, everyone.